Welcome out. What a great place to be, the Grace Gospel Church here in Taconite, Minnesota. And uh, what a great place to worship and honor and magnify and glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No, no better place to be on a Sunday than here. Wish we could do it, honestly, I wish we could do this every day. What a great, great place to be. Kevin talked about some of those things already up there, the prayer list, but I just want to give a couple shout outs, you know, like, you know, uh, this place uh, takes, this is a body. It's a body of believers coming together collectively. We're the body of Christ. You know, he's the head. There's nobody more important here than anybody else. And I uh, just want to, you know, say thanks, you know, to our piano players and, you know, Kevin with prayer. He just prays so beautifully and I just appreciate him. But, you know, come up this morning and the whole parking lot's clean. You know, Pat, I know Pat spent a lot of time this week. I think he spent more time in the truck behind the wheel than he did in bed this week. And, uh, you know, but he always finds time to make the place clean. Appreciate him. And Kevin spending the time here also. And Dom shoveling. You know, Sten, you know, he actually cleaned uh, the, one of the bathrooms for us this morning or, or yesterday for us. You know, it takes all of us to make this work. You know, we've got a lady... Yvonne is making stuff for the church, and we have here for, you know, Goodwill Offering. If you want to get a pair of socks, a hat, you know, crocheted, a pair of gloves for girls or boys. They, uh, just incredible what the people do for the church. And thankful to be part of a body that cares for others, that loves others. And, uh, you know... Nice to be able to pull up on a Sunday morning and not have to shovel, walk through snow to come into church. And I'm grateful for those people that, you know, do those things. It takes all of us to make this work. And I just, you know, like Steve was mowing the lawn all summer. Just to so, so appreciate these people. So there's probably, I look around and there's a lot of people that do a lot of things for the church here. And thank you for that. The people that sing and everything. And people that pray. He had a text this morning from Yankee. Yankee was thinking of us this morning. He says, it's 56, beautiful and warm and balmy in Florida. So we took a picture on the way to church here. We said, it's negative one and warm and balmy in northern Minnesota. So Carlton sent him a picture back. Where the trees are all <laughs> stiff. They look how I feel. Yeah. But... Uh, Beautiful, yeah. <laughs> I wish I felt beautiful. <laughs> uh, I might look beautiful, but no. <laughs> no, I don't either. But anyways, uh, the prayer list. The good news voice. If you want to get the prayer list, appreciate the people that pray for the people. You know, what an honor it is to people to pray. And how God will answer our prayers through it. How Paul, he just said it was an honor to pray for people, but and how he coveted the prayers of others and how he was delivered through some of his infirmities, you know, some of the, the afflictions he was going through, that he could be imprisoned and he could be beaten, yet he could be filled with joy. And prayers from others helped him with that. And what an honor it is to do that for people, to pray for each other. The scout looks good today. We have offering box in the back. We have some very faithful people here that give, it's, and it's between you and the Lord, whatever you decide to give. I do want to note that we are getting a new front entrance at the church, so we're getting all a whole new glass, aluminum, a whole new front entrance at the church here, and that uh, we already paid for over half of it down, and, and uh, we have the other half ready. When it gets installed, we're thinking about March, it'll get installed, so looking forward to that, and then we'll probably have enough money next spring, summer to redo all these windows. And again, just what a great place to be able to have where we can come and worship, be warm, invite people out, people can feel welcomed, have some coffee, cookies, and hear the greatest message in the world, that you're loved, loved by, loved by Christ, that he loved you so much that he died for you. You know, I've always said that nobody's ever died for me except Jesus. You know, we have our military men and women have given their life for our country to have freedom. 
But nobody died for me to save me from a hell I deserve to heaven I don't, and that's Jesus Christ. But I heard the song this week that said, a father that gave his son to die for us. And I've never thought of it like that, how Jesus Christ voluntarily gave his life. But the father gave his son. And I'm thankful for a father that he gave his son for us. We have so much to be thankful for. And ultimately, today we'll read about Christ, hear about his word. This is a, looking forward to this week. We have our Christmas service this Friday at 7 o'clock. And uh, I think if you, if you want to invite your family out and friends, I think you'll enjoy it. We're going to have a little bit more singing than usual. And we do have, we're blessed with you know more than one piano player. We have multiple piano, piano players, and two of them will be playing that night. We'll do four songs in the beginning and four songs in the end. And uh, we'll probably be singing some things by candlelight. It'll just, uh, for us to be able to get our minds right and set the mood and just to give thanks unto the Savior that was born. It's the 25th that we celebrate. We don't know exactly the date, but what a day we can remember. And how they brought him presents. We give presents, you know, like Austin's birthday. You know, we sent... I didn't give him a present. I probably should have gave him a present, but you know how we give presents. But you know how the kings, the wise men, they brought Christ presents, gold, incense, and they brought a myrrh. Who would give myrrh for a birthday present? Myrrh is uh, what they would use for embalming the bodies back then. But the wise men knew that he was come, he was revealed in the flesh to do one thing, and that is to die for our sins. So on his birthday, the day that the Savior was revealed in the flesh to all mankind, the wise men brought him myrrh, embalming, basically an embalming product for his body. And I'm like, wow, just uh, incredible what, the, what Christ did for us, how he set aside his glory, revealed himself in fleshly man, fully God, fully man. But that's what we're going to celebrate this coming Friday. Kevin went through most of that. Wednesday night we'll have Bible study. This coming Monday is going to be canceled. So we will not have our third Monday of the month for crafts and devotion for women. That will be canceled tomorrow night. Correct? So if you turn your Bibles over to Hebrews chapter 3, we're going to talk about Jesus. In chapter 1, or chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Consider Jesus. I encourage you to follow along in the Bible, too. And if you have a Bible in front of you, it's page 1318. 1318. We'll be reading some things in Numbers today, the book of Numbers. But consider Jesus. This is what chapter 3, verse 1 says. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. And the more I think about consider Jesus, you know, we're going to read... You know, we're speaking to believers here in chapter 3. Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly. We know they're saved individuals. But I think we, in our, in our times and in life, we just need to consider Jesus. Consider, you know, what he said, what he did. Reflect on things. Because everything we have comes back to him. So we'll get into that in a second. We have a specific learning outcome that uh, we want everybody to know. If you're sitting here today and I ask you a question, where are you going when you die? Hopefully you could clearly explain why you're going where you're going. I'm going to heaven. Why? Because I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, was very resurrected for me. Well, can you lose it? No. Nope. Why? Because Christ died for all of my sins. How about 10 years from now? Can you lose it then? No, nope. because Christ died for all of my sins. See, just like I was physically born once, I'm spiritually born one time. It's this, a time in your life when you've come to Christ, when you recognize that you're a sinner and you need a Savior. 
When you come to in your mind and be like, man, I know I'm not good enough. Could never ever be good enough. And ultimately, you come to Christ by faith and you trust that he did it for you because sin requires a death payment. We know that we've all sinned for all sin and come short of the glory of God. Every week I go to the jail, Herman and I go to the jail, and this last Monday night we had two men come to Christ by faith, two men. Usually we get one. And we had two men this week. It was great. And uh, it was to hear these men, uh, you know, had one man like, I hope I'm going to heaven. And he was talking about ultimately how he thought he was, you know, doing, he would do enough good deeds to outweigh the bad he had talked about. And then I had another young man that, you know, believed in that in reincarnation, that in the, the life that he lived this life, his choices would affect ultimately if he'd have a better life or a lesser life, you know, and ultimately we showed him the word of God because it's pull up the Bible and it says, if we showed you in the Bible that God says you, you can know you have eternal life and it's through Jesus Christ, would you believe it? And both men said yes. So we showed them in the word first that they're sinners, then how much Christ loved them, paid for that. But oftentimes we like to compare ourselves to men in the jail, compare ourselves to people that are on skid row. So I always tell people, instead of comparing yourself to individuals like that, compare yourself to God. And when you compare yourself to God, we miss the mark. We're sin. We fall short of that glory. We know that the wages of sin is death. Wages of sin is death. We deserve the right to die. Wages. I go to work every week and I get a paycheck. You know, it's merit-based. The wages, I put in a 40-hour week, I get a 40-hour paycheck. Same thing here, because we sinned. We, everybody here has earned the right to die. That's what sin does. Wages of sin is death. We, we deserve the right to physically die, and we deserve the right to spiritually die. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Heaven is a perfect place. Not even a lie shall enter into it. But your name that is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, it says. Heaven's a perfect place. Well, Christ came from heaven and he offers you his perfection to get to heaven. No one can earn his salvation. We can never earn it, but he'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. He'll give it to you by his grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not a works of any man should boast. If I handed Andy this remote, what would he have? He'd have this remote right now. If I handed Andy this Bible, what would he have? He'd have a Bible. If Jesus Christ walked in this room right now and said, here's my righteousness, what would he have? He would have Jesus Christ's righteousness right now. And that's what happens when we come to him by faith. He gives us his perfection. For by grace are you saved through faith. Good stuff. Christ died for our sins, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We receive his righteousness. Colossians 2, verse 13 and 14 tells us he paid for all trespasses. And 14 there at the end, he says, nailing them, taking them out of the way, nailing them to the cross. So everything that you've ever done, past, everything that you're doing right now, present, everything that you've done, will have done in the future, God has written down all of your sins and the second you come to Christ by faith, he took them to the cross and he nailed them, covering them with his shed blood, paid in full. That's amazing. That's what he does for us. And all he asks is that we would believe, that we would come to him by faith, that we would believe. For God so loved the world, for God so loved Austin, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, invitation to anybody, whosoever believed in him should not perish, not go to hell, but have eternal life, everlasting life. Truthfully, truthfully, I say unto him, he that believeth on me hath. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life right now. You get the eternal life does nothing for us if it, we don't get it the second we believe. We're born again, we're forever's child. Here it says you can know you have eternal life because that's what he promises in Titus 1-2. You can know you have eternal life. God wants us to know where we're going before we get there. These things are written unto you. Believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know 
that you have eternal life, that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. So those are the seven points of truth that we cover every week. Let's get into Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And I'll read. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, capital A, and the high priest, capital H and P, of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that build all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ has a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. So we see the first verse here, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. You know, his name's not Jesus Christ. You know, it's not his first, last name. Those are titles. Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus, Yahshua is salvation. But eternal security is preached all over through the word. It is. Wherefore means for this reason. So we, for this reason. So what did we read in chapter 2? The reason Christ re revealed lower than the angels in verse 1, 3. The reason he was revealed in the flesh as a man, fully God and fully man, Hebrews 1, 3. He tasted death for all mankind, Hebrews 2, 9. And when individuals neglect not the salvation that is offered in Christ Jesus, Hebrews 2, 3. Believe that Jesus Christ died on for your dead of sins, died on the cross for your dead of sins. His resurrection proved that he died for all of your dead of sins. The second you believe you're born again into God's family, Hebrews 2, 11 through 13. Remember he says there in 11, he's not ashamed to call them brethren. He's not ashamed to call us his children in verse 13. We know that Christ is not ashamed to call us his brethren, 2.11. For this reason, in 3.1, we're called holy brethren. Not only does God see us as, brother, as his brothers and sisters in Christ, he sees me as his little brother, but he sees us as holy. Why? Because Christ paid for all of our sins. And that's how we should live our life. And we would see ourselves dead on the lance and alive unto Christ. That this old man would die continuously every single day, and the new man in me, the new name, would live continuously for Christ. So notice here, his holy brethren are partakers of the heavenly calling. There's not one believer that's ever been a partaker of the heaven. Hev There's not one non-believer that is a partaker of the heavenly calling. The only partaker of the heaven heavenly calling is a believer. So Hebrews 3, 1 tells us who God is speaking to. It's to his brethren. It's to his children. To his brothers and sisters who he sees as holy. Now that a person becomes a child of God, the question becomes, do I live by faith? Reading his word? Yielding to the indwelling power of the spirit that's in me? following his will to be done in my life as an obedient child of God? Or do I want to be a disobedient child of God? That's the only, and only you can answer that question. Living by faith, reading his word, following his will to be done in our lives, and yielding to the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, you know what that does? It gives us rest. It gives us peace. Now let me, it's not a rest as in doing nothing. Because when you're laboring for the Lord, we're, we're busy. We're busy. We're sending money to the Philippines, Haiti. We're, we're doing things, plowing, shoveling. We're busy. So it's not a rest as in 
I get to sit back and you know, sit in the hammock all day and do nothing. No. But it's a rest as in this. That no matter what happens in my life, that God's God. Christ is far better. We learned a couple weeks ago, we looked at Psalm 37, 5, and we learned to commit it to the Lord and know that it will come to pass. That in life and death, that our life can magnify Christ. That no matter what, even if God has required me to die, he wants me to die as his son died at 33. Often my grandpa died at 49 years old, and I'm like, man, what a... 49, way too young. Christ died at 33. John the Baptist was beheaded at 33. But we know what? We can learn from reading the Bible that death is gain. Death is gain. So we can learn to commit it to the Lord and know that it will come to pass. A lot of them, we can learn that God's God. Now we're going to read in Hebrews 3, 4, 5, and we're going to see this comparison of the, of the children wandering in the wilderness when the Israelites were brought out of Egypt. So we can see here, do you remember the story when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt? God promised them the land of Canaan, a land of milk and honey. Matter of fact, that land was promised to Abraham when he was brought down through there. In Genesis chapter 12, and then before he went down into Egypt, he was promised this land. The land that Israel has today, the land that they want to have a two-state solution, they want to give to the Palestinians. Actually, they own more land than what there is actually they have today. But we know that this land, the Israelites, I think he told uh, Abraham, you know, it was like 400 years after that they would come. And Joseph was a descendant. He was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And Joseph, when he became, you know, the, the second most powerful man in the world for Pharaoh, Joseph died. They said, take my bones and bury them in that land. So they knew this land. So the Passover happened. We all know that. We read that in Exodus. We see Charlton Heston and when we watch you know, when he comes and he has a staff and we watch that every Easter and Passover, how the Israelites were brought out of Egypt. The Passover happened and the angel of death came in and killed all the firstborn that did not have the blood appointed to the doorpost. And I believe that blood that on the doorpost was just like this. The top and the sides of the door, I believe, a picture of a cross. The Israelites were led out of Egypt. God de defeated Pharaoh. The greatest army of that time, the world power of Egypt. And God defeated them at the Red Sea. He led them in. He divided the sea and led them in. And ultimately the sea buried all of Pharaoh, Pharaoh and all of his men. See, God had a plan for his people. He promised them a land. Moses sent 12 spies into the land of Canaan. We know that story with Caleb and Joshua. The spies came back, and what did they say? So we need to remember what God did for these people. Turn over to Numbers chapter 13. going to be page 181. Numbers chapter 13. If you read one, you can see verse 1, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, and then ultimately he took one from each tribe, and these were the names of the tribe of Ruma, and Shemu, the son of Zakor. The tribe, verse 5, tribe of Simeon, Shaphat went. Then verse 6, Judah, Caleb. Then he dropped down to 8, tribe of Ephraim, Oshia, the son of Nun, which we know is Joshua, which tells us in verse 16 who he is. But I'm going to start reading in 27, so it's going to be page 182. Look at all these people. He's feeding them every morning with manna. They were given manna every morning. 
And that started in Exodus chapter 17. But here they are, Numbers chapter 13, verse 27. And they told him and, we, and said, We came unto the land whither thou sent us. So those 12 spies came back. Ten of them have been, had an unfavorable report. And surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. They brought back these huge grapes, grapevines, that actually two men had to carry. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled. Remember Jericho? Joshua marched around it. Well, that didn't, that, that didn't happen yet. And the cities are walled and very great, and moreover, we saw the children of Anak here. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people. He calmed them down. The people were getting riled up. Stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. You can see his faith here. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And you could see the people going back in their faith. They just put the, applied the blood to the mantle a few weeks before, six months before. And these people are starting to go back in their faith. They brought up an evil report of the land, 32, which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that saw, that saw, that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and we were in their sight. 14, and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword? That our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. There were slaves in Egypt. They were beaten by the Egyptians. But because of their unbelief, they went backward. And we see that with believers today. People will get saved, they come to Christ by faith, and then they go backwards. God's got something planned better for us. Because what happened to these people is they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Look at Numbers chapter 14, verse 29. Every day those spies were up there, they got a year applied for wandering. Look at verse 29. Your carcasses, and the Lord is telling me, speaking through Moses, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. And all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. So you had 600,000 men. We know that because I think it was in chapter 12, it talked about 600,000. So probably a million and a half people, men, women, and children. And the Lord was feeding them with quail and he was feeding them with manna. And everybody over 20 is going to die except Caleb, Caleb and Joshua says here, and they were, it's all they did is complain about God. And it made me think about my life. The times, you know, do I just sit around and complain? Do I murmur like the, the children of Israel? Or am I thankful like Caleb and be like, you know what? And Joshua, you know what? God's promised something better for my life. I need to live like I'm a child of the king. Because Satan doesn't want you to do that. Satan wants you to have zero testimony for Christ. Look at 30. Doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, except Caleb, the son of Jephunai, Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, which you said should be as prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. Your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years, 
It's sad that the sins of the fathers became the sins of the children right there. Because these dads lacked a life by faith, their children had to suffer. They had to wander for 40 years. We are our brother's keeper. We have a responsibility to each other, and we have a responsibility to our children to make good choices. Bear your, bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which you search the land, 40 days, each day for a year shall be your, be, bear your iniquities every 40 years. You shall know my breach of promise. And I, the Lord, have said, and I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him, by bringing up a slander upon the land, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land, died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun, Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. If you read on, they wake up the next day and they're like, we're ready to go take the land. God's like, too late. Too late. So a lot of people will look at the, the wandering in the wilderness and what we need to clarify when we get into Hebrews chapter 3, 4, and 5, you know, crossing the Jordan and moving in the land of Canaan is not a picture of us going to heaven. We'll sing hymns that will talk about crossing the Jordan and into the land of Canaan is like going to heaven, and it's not. Crossing the Jordan and living in the land of Canaan is learning to live by faith, not by sight. These people saw giants around them. They knew this land that God promised, he just brought them out of Egypt. He just redeemed them like us from a hell they deserve to a heaven they don't. We'll get saved, but then we go back to our fleshly ways and we'll try to live in this world, not by faith. In Hebrews, the Christian life will be compared to some individuals wandering in the wilderness. So when we study Hebrews here, it's going to be compared to those individuals of wandering. Because some Christians, that's what they do after they get saved, is they wander. After a person comes to Christ by faith, God wants them, us, to grow in our faith. Living by faith, reading his word, following his will to be done in our lives, yielding to the indwelling power of the Spirit, listening to that, gives us a life of rest. Not worrying in unbelief, but knowing whatever happens in my life, God's God. Some Christians will wander their entire life and live a life of unbelief. They're saved, but they never come to a place of rest in their life. But let us continue to read and learn about Jesus Christ. So when we get further on, we're going to come back to that context of the wandering in the wilderness. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 3, 1 there, and look at the Apostle A, capital A, because it's interesting certain words there in Hebrews 3 that he used. The Apostle A, the capital, I'm sorry, the word Apostle, capital A. We don't have to speculate who we're talking about here because the verse tells us at the end of the verse who it's about. It's about Jesus. The Apostle, the High Priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is commissioned. That's what, the, that's what the apostle, the word apostle means. One who is commissioned to speak Christ. He's the one that was commissioned that brought God to man. That's what the apostles. See, he's a better apostle. He's better than the twelve. But he's also our high priest here. He intercedes on our behalf of his children, his brothers and sisters, and Christ to the Father. We just read that in Hebrews 2.18, how Christ intercedes on our behalf. When we're thinking about sin, we're, we're tempted to fall in that temptation, how we're to go to him in prayer, and he will help us with those temptations in our life. Whatever vice you have in life, whatever sin that, you know, that you're struggling with, he's the high priest. He intercedes on our behalf. 
And he can help us with whatever we're going through. He knows exactly what you're going through at any time. Like we talked about like last week, Scout. He was a baby. He knows exactly what Scout's going through. He was a, a young child. He grew up a teenager, an adolescent. He grew into adulthood. He was mocked, backstabbed. His friends betrayed him. If you're a young man, one young woman, and your friends have betrayed you, Christ knows exactly what you, what you feel like. Maybe you're going through dying. Christ knows exactly what you're going through. For he died. And he is the high priest. But he's also the profession of our faith. Which is confession. See, Jesus Christ is the confession of every believer's faith. How so? I stay, I, and I'll just give you some, you know, where are you going when you die? To heaven. Why? I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. He's the confession of my faith. The profession, can you lose it? No. Why? Because Christ died for all my sins. He's the profession of my faith. Now what? And I go through a list of things. It is because of Christ that I'm forever a child of God. It's because of Christ that I'm called his brother. It's because of Christ he intercedes as the high priest on my behalf. It's because of Christ I can boldly go to the throne room of grace and pray every day to him. It's because of Christ I have victory in my life. It's because of Christ I have peace and rest. It's because of Christ that one day I'll be part of the rapture. It's because of Christ I'll receive rewards. It's because of Christ that one day I'll partake in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, verse 7, 8, and 9. It's because of Christ I will reign with him for a thousand years. I will be rule and reign with him for 1,000 years. It's because of Christ that I will not partake in the great white throne judgment where the lost, the spiritually dead, will be judged according to their works. It's because of Christ that I can have peace and rest in a world that's chaotic, a world that's unpredictable, because I know who's in control. It's because of Christ I can live by faith, read his word, follow his will to be done in my life, yield to the indwelling power of the Spirit, and he gives us life, rest, and peace when everything around us is a tornado. See, Christ is far better. He is the profession of every believer's faith. Christ is the one that is faithful and true. We go to verse 2. Hebrews 3 2 says, Who's faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all the house. And we're going to see this compare contrast with Moses in the verse 3 6 verses here. But Christ is far better than Moses. Moses was a great man of faith. We know that. The Bible tells us. How are you? He was a sinner, just like you and I. And he needed a savior. It's interesting that the devil actually fought for Moses' Bible. In the book of Jude, just before you get to Revelations, one chapter, that one chapter has so many truths. But in verse 9 there, it says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. So there's a le different lesson there, ultimately, that, you know, how the archangel didn't curse Satan. He said, the Lord rebuke thee. But more importantly, what I wanted to point out is, Satan wanted his body. I wonder why. But say, I, I, and I, this is what I think. Satan wanted the body of Moses for something, and I'm sure Satan wanted to build a shrine so man would worship Moses more than God. We are to worship God and God alone. And we do like to worship men in this world. Kiss the rings of men, kiss their feet, which is ridiculous. We should worship God. John the Revelator fell two times to an angel in the book of Revelations. Revelation 22, verse 8 and 9, he says, And I, John, saw things and heard them. And when I heard and seen and fell down to worship before the feet of an angel, which showest me these things, then said he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant 
and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the saying of this book, worship God. I want you to turn over to Revelation chapter 19. And we got some people that can read in Bible study. They read very well. And one of these days, maybe just, I won't call on anybody this second, but maybe one day call on somebody to read. Because it's, 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 it's nice to have people partake in reading the message. But just look at Revelation 19 here. He says, and after these things, it's on page 1364, 1364, and I'll give you a second. It's the last book of the Bible. In Revelation, if you want to know what the book of Revelation is all about, Look at verse 1, chapter 1. Just go, go to page 1349. So you can hold your finger at 19. But if you want to know what the book of Revelation is about, Revelations 1 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. He's the one that can break the seals, He's the one that you know, has the bowls and the trumpets. It's Him. People always are speculating what Revelation is about, and it tells us right there in verse 1, 1-1, one, one, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now let's look at chapter 19. Chapter 19 on page 1364 says this, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, false religions, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah! And her smoke rose up after, up forever and ever. And the four and twenty, twenty elders and the beast fell down and worshipped God, and that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants. Ye that fear him, both small and great. And I had heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters. There's a song that says that. And as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God, omnipotent, all powerful reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. His wife hath made herself ready. That's us, the bride. That's us. And to her was granted that she would be arrayed in fine linen. Remember, we're given this fine linen, the robe of righteousness in Isaiah 61, 10, I think it is. Clean and white, for fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. That's us. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant. We just read this in 22. Of thy brethren they have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10 tells us that all prophecy is about Jesus. 11. And I saw heaven opened up. And behold, a white horse. People have asked me in the past, you know, is there animals in heaven? Well, I tell you what. I know there's horses, which is pretty cool. I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Capital F and T. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. See, after the marriage supper of the Lamb, He's going to come back at the second advent. He's going to put his feet on the Mount of Olives, and it's going to be the battle of Armageddon. Look what happens. His eyes were as flame as a fire, and on the head were many crowns. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the Prince of peace. He had a name written on that no man knew but he himself. 
and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. The armies which were in heaven followed upon the white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's us. I don't like riding horses, but at that time, I'm probably going to love riding a horse. Because I'll be riding one horse coming back with him. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that which his should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Do you know that in Hebrews 4.12, that it says the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword? So you know what? It cuts both ways. One, it reveals that we're a sinner, and ultimately it'll strip you down to nothing, and it'll be like, wow, I need a Savior. But if you reject that Savior, he's going to cut you down, and you'll go to hell forever. It's a two-edged sword. It'll cut both ways. You don't get to have your cake and eat it too. It's either you believe or you don't. And the armies which were in heaven followed upon the white horse clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and, that it, and with it he should smite the nations and shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture, on his knee, on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowl, that fly in the midst of the heaven, come and gather yourselves together upon the supper of the great God. So this is not the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's a supper that's going to be at the battle of Armageddon. That you may eat, may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, of them that sit on them, the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. They're going to sit and they're going to think they're going to be the world's going to be so deceived by Satan that they think they're going to defeat God. And the beast was taken because we know that the, Satan is only a copycat. We know that there's the false prophet, there's the Antichrist, and there's Satan. And we know that Satan will enter a man and that will be the Antichrist and that will be this area right here. Do I think that man's alive today? Maybe. Maybe. We're close. I believe the rapture could happen at any time. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet, you can read about them in Revelations 12 and 13, that wrought miracles, they, they actually called down fire from the sky. They have powerful miracles which, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive in the lake of fire, right down here. The Antichrist, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. He speaks it, done. Which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And we can see there, I think it's in verse 2, 22. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. And we will have peace on earth 1,000 years. We can never have peace without the Prince of Peace. So we can see we're to worship only God. We can see that in Revelation 19, 11, that he is faithful and true. Christ is far better. Even though Moses was loyal and faithful servant to God, Jesus Christ is more loyal and faithful to his Father. He is forever faithful and true. Make us go back to Hebrews 3 1. Consider Jesus. Consider Christ. In your daily walk, we should be considering Jesus. How would Jesus handle this? What would Jesus do? How did Jesus handle us? How should I represent him as his brother? Hebrews 3.3 3. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. Moses was a great servant in the house of God. He built the tabernacle. However, Christ is the one who built the tabernacle and temple in heaven. Many people don't know this. But look at these verses. 
See, when Christ died on the cross, he went into the belly of the earth for three days and three nights, just like Jonah was in the belly of the well three days and three nights. And he led captivity captive. You can't see it up here, but before people died in the Old Testament, they didn't go to heaven. They went to a place called Abraham's bosom. And that's where Christ went for three days. And then when he ascended, he took them high. And we see here, before he did that, after he went to the Abraham's bosom for three days, what did he do in heaven? This is what he tells us. And this is what the whole Old Testament is about. It points to what Christ did. Hebrews 9, 11 through 12 says, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not the one that was built by Moses' hands or Solomon's hands, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So whoever wrote the book of Hebrews must have been like right there, must have been like he was pointing out the temple at the time. Neither by the blood of bulls and goats, blood of goats and calves. Look at that. By, but by his own blood, he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He entered into the holy place. Huh. Look at this verse here. Hebrews 9, 23 expounds. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, than goats and calves. For Christ has not entered in the holy place made with hands, nope, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. That's what he did. That's what a high priest does. He appears in front of God for us. Look at 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often. He didn't have to do it continuously like the Levitical high priest did. As a high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others, we know that in Leviticus it tells us that, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation. If that was true, he would have suffered forever. No, but he's God. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin. Do I got that verse 26 up there? At the end there. Put away sin. Look at the last few words there. By the sacrifice of himself. Look 27. And it is appointed unto men once to die. We're all going to die. But after the judgment, which judgment are you going to be? Judgment seat of Christ? White throne judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of men. And unto them that look for him, Shall he appear a second time without sin on the salvation? He will put his feet on earth here and he's not coming back as a savior. He's coming back as king of kings, lord of lords. We just read that. See, Christ is far better than the earthly sanctuary. Christ is far better than the earthly sacrifices, the earthly sacrifices of bulls and goats. The one sacrifice of Christ, think about this. The one sacrifice of Christ is far better than all the Old Testament. Moses was given the law 14, he wrote what well, he wrote the first five books in about 1445 BC. So we could say for 1500 years, all these Old Testament sacrifices, if we combine them all into one, did not compare to the one that Christ paid for. Because all the Old Testaments combined could not pay for one sin. But Christ, his one sacrifice, paid for all sin forever. See, Moses gave us the law. But grace and truth come by Christ. The law was given to mankind to strip you to the core and reveal that you're a sinner. There's no man that's going to stand before God and be like at the Dwight throne judgment and be like, yeah, but I... No. He will reveal that he's a sinner. The law reveals to mankind that he has earned the right to go to hell. That's what the law does. No man can earn the right to go to heaven. However, the grace that is offered in Christ, he'll give it to you freely because Christ is far better. Now look at Hebrews chapter 3, 4. 
For every house is built by some men, but he that built all things is God. If any man denies that the deity of Christ, shame on them. Because the Bible declares the deity of Christ. Because back in Hebrews 1, 2, 3, it tells us that he made all things. And here in verse 3, 4, it says that God has made all things. And that's Christ. Christ made the world. He created all things. He built all things as God. Moses might have built the temple, the tabernacle. Solomon might have built the temple. However, it is Christ who's built all of creation. The things seen and the things not seen have all been spoken into existence by God. We've got a couple more verses and then we will end here. And I'm going to show you something about the tabernacle and the temple. Verse 5, And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were spoken after. See, I believe everything in the Bible is a testimony of something related to Christ. Psalm 47, Hebrews 10, 7 tells us the Bible speaks of him. And here we have in verse 5, it says, And Moses fairly was faithful and also as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. However, we should be careful and in not interpret things ourselves. We should be interpret what's been revealed to us, like the Passover spoken of in, in Exodus 12, when they took a lamb that was just a few days old, and they lived with it, and the kids pet it, and the kids slept with it. And then three days later, they were told to sacrifice that lamb and apply that lamb to their doorposts. That same Passover is here as Christ. Purge out there for the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover sacrificed for us. So we see the picture of this happening in Exodus 12. He's our Passover. So we don't, angel death goes over us. We don't experience that second death. The veil that's discussed in the temple, we read in Matthew chapter 27, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. Remember when he died, an earthquake came, and ultimately the twain, this 30-foot high temple, this 30-foot high veil, curtain, was like five inches thick, ripped from top to bottom. It says that and the veil of the temple was rent, twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Well, this veil is a picture of his flesh. Hebrews 10.20, By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. See? Here's a picture of the temple. You might be able to see it. You can see here. These are the gates to enter. But here is the temple. And you would go in and you would actually approach the entrance to the temple through the brazen altar. And it's the same thing. You have to go through Christ to get access to God. You go through that as Christ was sacrificed. He was the Lamb of God for us. But also you go into the holy place. And here they have, you know, the candlesticks. They would have the incense. And then they would have the showbread, the bread that they would cook daily. But here's the veil. And here's the Holy of Holies. Not in the Holy of Holies, but the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant had the... Had the uh, the law, the law of the Ten Commandments were in the Ark of the Covenant. They had a jar of man in there, and they had Aaron's rod, an almond staff that budded with dead. But ultimately, we see a picture here how, how ultimately the high priest, the apostle of the Christ, how he tore down this veil and gave us access to God. That's what he did. That's what he did. It's through the death of Christ that he made access for man to come into the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies. He is the apostle and he is the high priest. Moses is a testimony of those things spoken after. Moses is a type. Jesus Christ is the antitype. He fulfills those. We'll go to Hebrews 3, 6 and we'll end here. I had a few things, but But Christ is the son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm into the end. 
See, Christ is the son over his own house. Christ cares for his family, his brothers and sisters. You know what he does? He looks out for us. And I say this, he knows precisely where you're at and what you're going through. He's experienced it himself. And I say, let us not live our lives as we, let's not live our lives as we are burdened with past decisions. Because I'm sure we all have regrets. Let us not live our lives as we are threatened by present conditions. The war, Russia's threats, food shortages, fuel shortages. But let us live for the eternal things of God. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, hmm, the flesh. Austin said he's old at 20. Wait, the Kevin said. The outward man perish. Every day we die a little bit more. But look at that. Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. We get a filling of the Spirit by the reading of the Word. For our light affliction, light affliction, which is but for a moment, because our life on earth is just a mere vapor, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So this peace that we have, this rest, even though we're laboring for the Lord, these light afflictions that we go through, is for a more eternal weight of glory. While we look at not the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Be not like the Israelites that focus their eyes on the giants, the Amalekites, the Jebusites, the Hittites, but ultimately they cave and be like, you know what, if, if God has declared that for us, let's take it. And we should live every day with this, looking, action there, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior Jesus Christ, the rapture. We should live every day like he's coming today. Man. The application for me, maybe is different for you, but I think for through Hebrews, we'll be just saying the truth is, Christ is far better. He is. Was there a promise to proclaim? Yeah, I believe so. Believers are beholding brethren and partakers of the heavenly. And the last one, example me to follow, consider Jesus. He's the example. Let me show you something. Let this hand you represent you and I, and this wallet represents our sin. God loves us, hates our sin. Sin is what separates us from God. Man will try to tell you that you can cover that sin up by getting water baptized or dedicating your life to the Lord or giving money, but we know that the Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins. Let this hand you represent Jesus Christ as God from eternity past. He's without sin, absolutely sinless. Left his glory, never left his deity because that's who he is. Revealed himself in the flesh. He had to become human holy man so he could make a human sacrifice for sin he died behold the lamb of god that takes away the sin of the world he died for our sins making a perfect sacrifice for sin providing an eternal redemption for us and when we believe that he gives us his righteousness put to our account let's all just close our eyes for a second here maybe somebody online or so we're watching the future here, just in the quietness of your mind. You can have a silent conversation with God. And if you're saved, you can just talk to God yourself. Tell him thanks for all the good things that he's done in your life. You know, pray for the people to hear the gospel message and to, to believe. 
you're not saved and if you're trusting in something else, when you heard the message, right now you can change your mind. In the quietness of your mind, you could say something like this. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's not these words that save you. It's what you believe. But you could say something like this in your mind. I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell when I die. I want to go to heaven. I just heard the good news. And right now I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and he resurrected for me. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ alone to save me. If you trusted in Christ alone right now, you can say thank you for you have just became his brother, his sister, which is awesome. Love to hear your testimony. You could share it with me someday. That would be great. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for Christ. We're just so grateful for your plan of salvation and for Christ to fulfill that. And as a child of God, we know that there's a purpose for us to be here. And we thank you that through the word that we can be like Caleb, that we can live a life by faith. That You have a purpose for us. You have proclaimed something more important to us. After we're saved, we're a child of the king. We're born again, we're forever child. And that we don't have to live in this world to be scared or burdened with the decisions we've made of past or the current threatenings in our life. But we can live by faith and read your word and that your purpose would be fulfilled in our life, that your will would be done in our life. We thank you for that. We thank you for the faith of the people that come out every week. We just pray that you could use this message and people bring glory to you, Father. What an honor it is to be able to share your word, and we thank you for that. We just pray that you be with the people here today as they travel safely home. Bring us back this Friday where we can give glory to you again. And Father, we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We'll have our last song.